Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. The University of Alberta respectfully acknowledges that we are located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Salto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our community. For this, this afternoon, I'm delighted, really delighted, to be able to introduce Owen Mundy and Joel Dietrich, who will be um, answering some questions in relation to the presentation they shared with us about their work. Owen Mundy is an artist, designer, and programmer. Mundy's, re Mundy's research investigates public space, information privacy, and big data. Owen Mundy is a former photographer in the US Navy, where he unloaded surveillance film on, flight, on a flight deck of an aircraft carrier. Mundy has worked in journalism, marketing, and creative fields. Tori, what is It's not me. <laughs> he has a 10 year career in web and app development, including multimedia, NEH funded African Americans in Cinema History Project, and co founded Your Art Here, a nonprofit organization to put art on billboards and other public spaces, usually reserved for advertising. Owen Mundy's work has been exhibited in multiple museums and galleries in New York, Berlin, Los Angeles, Rotterdam, and Mexico City. Owen Mundy is a visiting associate professor of digital studies at Davidson College in North Carolina. Joel Dietrich's paintings, drawings, and animations explore infrastructure, particularly housing and its manip manipulation by automated global economic systems. Her work has been shown at the Museum of Contemporary Art Jacksonville, Francisco MX in Mexico City, Tina B Festival in Prague and Venice, Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, Long March Beijing, and MPG Boston, amongst many others. Dietrich is the Kaiser Family Assistant Professor of Art and Digital Studies at Davidson College near Charlotte, North Carolina. So a very warm welcome to the both of you in a very, very cold, uh, snowy setting here in Edmonton, but thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. So we'll start, normally what we do is we ask people to post questions into the chat and then we'll invite the students to um, ask a question to you. So maybe we can just, and I'm Sean will maybe regulate the questions. Yeah, I'll happy to monitor, yep. So while uh, people are um, thinking of questions, maybe I can start with one. Uh, really enjoyed your presentation again, thank you. And um, I had a question, forgive me if the title, was it Illum Illuminos was the name of the piece? Yes. Um, you mentioned in it a concern you had about you know, you do these satirical things and then it becomes real after the fact. And, you know, I'm just thinking of course of these troubled political times and, um, and then in relation, I had the good fortune a couple of months ago to work with uh, the Yes Men oh. and That's great. think, you know, think through some of the things they've been doing. But anyway, it, it made me think about the use of satire today and, I don't know, do you have concerns? Would you shift how you might do a project like that, given how much misinformation is around? Oh, Does that make sense really, as a question? Yeah, that's a great question. Wow, <laughs> what a super question. Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard not to think of the yes men when you, when you think about satire and in art and you know the, the work that, that I've done and, and that Joel and I have done together is, um, uh, it influenced, I think, a lot by the Yes Men and, and hacktivism kind of in general. Um, there, there are other works, you know, before the Yes Men, like uh, we, we both started with Lewis Hawk. Uh, so Lewis Hawk, Liz Sisko, and David Alvaros, I believe, they did something called the, what was the name of that? Public Transit something yeah so yeah. they 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 received a giant nea grant for the national endowment for the arts and then they gave money back to undocumented workers in san diego um it was called oh arte reembolso and um art rebate is a spanish and english title and, and so um but yeah but but coming back to the to the yes man and and to your original question i think that 
Yeah, it, it's it's interesting how, so I stated in that presentation that that some of the work that I'd done became, you, you know, because uh, perhaps it was maybe slightly uh, technologically, you know, cutting edge, you know, it was, it was doing things that uh, technology wasn't meant to do, uh, which, you know, kind of aligns itself with a lot of the ways that Silicon Valley has emerged, you know, by by, by recognizing how technology can, can do something in the world that it's not currently doing. It, uh, our, our process is, is mainly about, you know, education, asking questions, you know, creative disturbance uh, while I can give Silicon Valley is often doing something giving. that's about, uh, Silicon Valley is often doing something about like capitalizing on some relationship between people. And so, but yeah, over the last five years, the uh, satire is has taken a new meaning, and it, it doesn't mean that um, that ar that artists and comedians and actors aren't doing satire. Um, you know, Stephen Colbert and Saturday Night Live, they're still doing satire. Satire is still a, and parody is still, I think, super important. But um, I think to answer your question, I I feel like. I feel like there's still a place, but you somehow have to ground the work. If at some point there's always like um, the question about, you know, where's the reveal? And, you know, if you, um, like I just saw the, the most amazing work uh, last week, actually, someone has made a website that is the quote, official Donald Trump uh, presidential library website. And it's like, I think it's djtrumplibrary.org or .com or something. Yeah, I'm sure you can Google and find it. <laughs> Sounds and very Yesman. It is very Yesman. It is, <laughs> it, and it is super thorough. It, I think it was made by an architecture firm. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things where you go, wait a second, this isn't real. There's too much thinking going on in here. And, and as you find, as you explore more, you eventually come to the, you know, you come to the about page and say like, okay, who made this thing? And so... I don't know. I, I mean, I guess I guess I would say maybe we need more satire in art. You know, maybe we need more people to be aware that this is a common practice and that and but we also need that kind of responsibility and that that about page that that explains it and that that says and that acknowledges and steps back out of the out of the magic world that they've created and says, OK, this is this is indeed a parody, a work of fiction but this is why you know and so i would say i would say we need more <laughs> okay, sorry it took me a long time to get there but that's that's what i think oh, it's great um other questions okay i have one from heather savard heather do you want to go ahead sure um so when you talked about um the tally saves the internet you talked about understanding the system and when you understand the system you can imagine a better internet so this is like a pretty big question but what does that actually begin to look like what does a better internet um, look like to you better internet um i mean more transparency right um a, a lot more um yeah people just being honest about how they're how they're profiting it seems like a, a big a big thing that has happened is all these invisible structures in the internet where, where data, everybody talks about data as the new oil, right? So that um, our data is being siphoned off without our knowledge. Um, so I, I feel like more transparency would be good. Also, um, I mean, just uh, people um, having the power to sort of, um, yeah, code, code their own interventions, you know, and um, make that, um, that code open source so that other people can build on those, you know, you know, build on those, uh, the previous efforts. Um, I don't know, what else, Ellen? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm big on both of those. I think those are both um, super important. The, the, the power or the, 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 the it, transparency and power over, over and control. Those are, if you look at like, um, if you look at the GDPR, the, the general data protection regulation that the, European Union passed last year or the year before. That, those are the main, they're like seven important um, um, 
uh, data rights that are outlined and um, uh, knowledge about what is happening to your data and, and control over uh, how it's processed, control over where it goes, control over where um, your information, uh, how your information can be used. Those are, I think, I think those are the two most important things that I would point out. Um, uh, oh, and also, well, I guess we both worked on a project called Commodify Us, where um, also people benefiting from the use of their data, like like monetary compensation, mm -hmm. which um, who's the the former presidential candidate Andrew Yang is that his name? Yeah. That had, so he's been doing um, similar initiatives in California, trying to push for people to get a bit of the profits. Uh, that would be an interesting strategy as well. Mm -hmm. So I would argue that. That that advertising and and manipulation. Um, we're, we're working on a paper right now about about tally about the the motivation for tally states the internet and and a big part of that is acknowledging that surveillance capitalism exists. You know, this is the from the title of Shoshana Zuboff's book, uh, in the age of surveillance capitalism. But also another big important piece is that um, advertising. Uh, the, the merger of, of data and advertising uh, accompanied with the use of behavioral psychology, you know, operant conditioning, Skinner boxes, uh, you know, it's used in casinos and video games and um, gamification. All these uh, kinds of, of sciences and trends used for manipulating masses of people in, it is normalized under the, under the, the you know, this umbrella of marketing and advertising, it's, it's considered normal. And so over the last hundred years with the rise of the corporation, uh, having more power than governments and people uh, combined, um, that, uh, that advertising and manipulation of masses of people is, is normal. And, and to me, the way that's evolved on the internet and, and, and the increase in speed and power of that, thanks to the internet is, I think that's also an important thing that I would change, um, you know, to, to denormalize that, to question whether or not it's, it's even moral to, uh, to use people's emotions against them. Great, we got lots of questions now lined up here. Okay, we'll try to keep our answers shorter. <laughs> no, this is great. Alexandra is next, would you like to ask? Uh, yeah, um, I guess I'll just repeat my um, question in the chat. Um, just a general question, but do you find now that there is a visible relationship between machine learning and the work that you've done with digital surveillance? I've done a little bit of research related to um, implicit bias in machine learning. So I'm just curious about your take on the topic. Uh, yeah. I, so I don't have much experience in machine learning. I find that, I don't know if you've seen the meme where um, Scooby-Doo and, and his gang are, they find the, the bad guy in the, you know, they, they say, okay, who, who is it really? And they pull off the, 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 the ghost mask of the, of the ML, the machine learning, and it, it's really just a bunch of algorithms and if statements underneath. Um, and I feel, I feel that one pretty ca pretty much captures what I think about machine learning. I think it's just you know it's just more technology, more ways to you know have automation and to and to automate decision making. You know, instead of like manually building uh, logic into a computer with if statements, you're 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 making you're making a, a computer program that's capable of learning enough to possibly make those decisions. I think there's a lot of problems with it and its implementation, you know, to decide whether or not someone should go to jail, whether or not they should get out of jail, whether or not, um, you know, a face is recognized. Um, and, um, well, I think, I don't know, I think they're, they're going to get, they're going to get better. Um, these systems are going to get better and, and we have to, we have to think about the way that, that, that not just machine learning, but you know, all the algorithms and all the computer software is biased. You know, it's all um, th there's there's always some degree to which the the people making the software are encoding their own biases in that software, and 
you know, and it's not just whether or not they tested it on dark skinned people or only light skinned people and whether or not it, it recognized people of color when it does facial recognition, but, um, but, but all the ways that they don't think about experiences other than themselves when they, they encode um, software. And so um, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but those are my thoughts on machine learning and bias. <laughs> but that's why it's good, Alexandra, that you're getting into that stuff is that we need more women, right? Yes. <laughs> For a start. So yeah, that's, that's, good. A, that's a really important start, more diversity. Okay, so next up, Gerard. Hello. Um, so just looking at the, I guess, the presentation and like other works you've done, um, I noticed a lot of it involves like data visualization. And I find this very interesting. I just want to know, I guess, um, if you had recommendations in so far as what language you might approach something like that with or like places to start, because I just find it to be like a very interesting technique to, to create works where you're kind of taking these big data sets, breaking out pieces and able to create work from it. Mm, yeah. Well, you um, take that one since you're more yeah. the Well, one of the question, one of the conversations that we have a lot is, so, so we both have an art, art background. We, we studied art and um, one of the questions we have a lot it's not necessarily about the production of data visualization or the aesthetic decisions or the technical decisions you have to make, like what software to use. But one, I think one of the interesting conversations is that when we make a work, we always have to kind of balance our need for uh, referencing the data, the index of it. You know, here's, here's, a, here's a measurement that came from the world uh, of the number of, you know, kawakas in a tree, right? And, <laughs> you know, and so how do we represent that? You know, is it through, is it through metaphor where we, where we don't really care about the number, but we think about, we want to think about the feeling of the number, or we want to think about referencing the number in other ways that are not about the measurement itself or the index. And so I always take the position that you know, we have to, we have to do one or the other that, the, that we have to have the, that there's a, there's this index that we're referencing and that somehow that data is, rep, is referenced. And Joel always has this kind of more, I think, poetic approach to it, where um, the index is, is maybe um, uh, serves the purpose of the, of this greater idea, which is to, is to, is to feel it or think about it. Uh, I think that's why it makes us a good team. Um, Can you guys hear us okay? There's some leaf noise, blowers. leaf blowers. <laughs> but Gerard, to answer your question, which was about the technology, um, I so so my process of data visualization is is uh, in, in its most simplified is um, first uh, get the data into uh, a spreadsheet. Or, or some way that you can simply represent it and just start to do, you know, make a pie chart, make a bar chart. Just, just try to start to understand it, you know, just get a data set and, and try to understand what that data has in it and then start to ask the data questions. It's a common method actually to say like, what does this data tell me? What does this data not tell me? You know, data is, is like a photograph. It's a, it's a picture of the world, but, but just like every photograph shows you some place in the world at some time in the world, it also props out a reality. It also leaves a lot of things not, um, not represented. And so, so data is, uh, it's, I, I like to think of it as like very much like a photograph. And, um, and so in the process, I always, you know, I get it into some kind of recognizable form. I start to answer, ask it questions and, I start to kind of imagine what it could look like. And then usually through that process, I, um, I, I start to realize what the technology is that I need to use. And so, you know, if I, if I want it to, to live online, then I might use D3 or some JavaScript or, or something like that. If I want it to exist on a mobile device or in a game, I might use Unity. 
if I want it to, um, yeah, I mean, so, so those are, so it really depends on, you know, you have to like also think about, you know, you're thinking about the data is here and you're moving forward from the data, but you also have to think about what is the, what is the in place that you want to end up and then go backwards uh, and kind of reverse engineer the process and make those decisions. And, you know, once you learn a programming language, it's, you can, you can transfer that knowledge to other languages pretty easily, I think, and make decisions based on what the data tells you when you ask questions of it. And I think and maybe sometimes answering questions with a concrete example is helpful. And I think um, the very last slide in our presentation is the NC State um, project that we were working on, which is a data visualization because it visualizes everything in Tally Saves the Internet. Um, and I think early on, we brainstormed about how to answer that project. And we talked about doing a map, but we were like, but there's so many map data visualizations. We can't just have like a map. And so then we sort of went from there. But um, I, yeah, so maybe, I don't know if you want to talk about, I, it, like Owen said, we finally decided we wanted to publish an app, which has not been published yet. <laughs> um, but um, so that's when he knew that he had to go into Unity, but you had to do a lot of work thinking about how you would get the data from Tally Saves the Internet. So mm -hmm. do you want to say anything about that as far as um, getting that data and pushing it around? Yeah, there's the, in the in the kind of like magic world of data visualization when you make these like beautiful graphics that that also have a grounding in the index of the world um there's also this this big piece that i i think doesn't get enough attention and that's the the moment from when you get the data to when you can actually use the data in the visualization that you've made and and most of that is just you know like headlocking the data into submission, you know, uh, writing, writing, uh, there's a whole uh, GitHub repo that's just full of data tools that I made for tally states the internet that takes a spreadsheet and transforms it into a JSON file or uh, the JSON file for the monsters is there's one indexed by the MID and then there's another one indexed by the tag so I can look it up in two different ways, you know, so there's all these different, there's this big piece of like, um, just having the data in the format that you actually need uh, so that you can make your your visualization. Can you guys hear us okay with that? I think it's good, yeah. Yeah, good, okay. So uh, next to Shirley Yang, Shirley. Uh, hello, can, can you guys hear? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I have a more general question um, regarding uh, using data collection in the design process. Uh, so in your opinion, um, how should web app game developers um, balance using data on user behaviors uh, to improve their design um, and respecting the user's privacy? Because um, in your game, Tally Saves the Internet, uh, in a way you were also collecting data. Um, so I was just wondering, like, what is your opinion on that? Yeah. Oh, you. I, I mean, yeah, there is a contradiction there, but um, all, the, all the user information is anonymized. And um, I think, yeah, and, and we, in our privacy policy, we talk, make it very clear that we're never going to share that information. Um, so yeah, it's been a tricky thing with um, Tally Saves the Internet because I think that the fact that you have to download the browser extension, is, there's a bit of trust there. Um, that's necessary and, and people can like sort of know us and know what our past works are and what we do as a living and and that that data trail uh, ironically builds that trust. So um, yeah, in our in our case it works out well. I don't know. Do you want to expand on that? Yeah, it, we had a we've had a lot of conversations about how to treat user data. Uh, you, you know, the, the, the game uh, originates from this this idea that we're, we're, we want to return that power, the power that Joel mentioned earlier, that, that your data is, is going in one direction and it, it only comes back to you in, in you know, paid influence and manipulation. And so why not make that data something that you, that you can enjoy and, and do something different with it? And so that was the, that was the original idea, but then through the conversations about 
how to empower users, uh, Joel kept mentioning that we have to, you know, we can't we can't just make a game that you know it's just like click here and you know that's not that doesn't have any kind of like benefit, and so that's that's how the there there are some important points like obviously the fact that as you play the game it it blocks trackers, so um, so that's that's one of the kind of like return values that a player gets from letting some of their data go, but then. Um, there's another, there are other moments where uh, Tally's stamina gets run down or her health gets run down from a battle and you have, you, you can, uh, you can instantly recharge if you take an hour break from the internet. Um, and, uh, and she, when you come back, she says, uh, oh, you've recharged, you've taken a break and you've recharged. And um, so, so we had several conversations about, um, about, about how to, how to protect their data, but how to also make sure that the 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 little bit of anonymized data that they were gonna they were gonna um, give up would would have this kind of uh, real world benefit um, and then the then there's the privacy policy which which is uh, very explicit about exactly what data points we use and what we do with those I paid a lot of attention to security when I was writing the the back end so that it you know it would um, not get hacked <laughs> and um, so. Yeah, but I think that's an important. I think that's a really good question because because um, in a lot of the works, there's a you know, it, it give me my data, commodify us. I know where you get all these. There's some kind of there's some kind of trade off. Uh, there's some kind of um, th there is user data involved, and and so we have to have to kind of be in tune to that. And also, if you if you um, if you download the game and and create an account and play, you can. Um, you can also see in the dashboard, um, you can actually see all the data that's been collected. And, um, uh, and, and it, um, when, when I made the design for the dashboard, I, I looked at the GDPR and the, and the data rights that are covered in the, in the, in the document. And um, just to make sure that, that, it, that it is like in, in tune to those, uh, to those data rights that people can see what data they can delete all delete of their data, their data. And they can delete their account anytime. Hmm. They, they, they know that it's not going to be processed. Um, they know that it's not going to be sold, you know. Um, and so, yeah, and so I, I think that, I think it was really helpful to have a document like the GDPR and, and, I, and I, I put a lot of work into the dashboard just because I feel like if if other people who are making data artwork using user data and they see that, hopefully they'll be influenced to do that too, because um, it's not always the case. You know, it's um, well, we it, it is extra it. work. Yeah, we had to do it. Yeah, me. in order to publish an app. Mm. Yeah, we we walked a very fine line in this project <laughs> to be able to actually get approved by Firefox and approved by Chrome with our app, but also be able to use user data. Uh, and also critique Firefox, not Firefox, but Google in the, in the process. So, yeah. So it's, it's definitely more work, but it's, it's fulfilling work. Great. Okay. Uh, Bailey is next. Bailey Lohman. Um, yes. I really hope this isn't too vague of a question because it's a little bit general, but, um, uh, I noticed that you guys, um, your projects take a lot of different forms. And I guess what I was wondering is when you go into a new project, do you s tend to focus on like what medium you want to explore and then go to a topic from there? Or do you find the topic that inspires you and pick the medium? Or is it kind of like they both influence each other when you're deciding? So that's just what I was wondering. That's a great question. Yeah, we do, we are sort of. All, all over the place and output. But um, I mean, I can see the thread very clearly, but um, to answer your question specifically, I think um, it's normally the, the ideas come first and then thinking about like, what's, what's the most ideal way to put those things out in the world. Um, and a lot of things like Tally Saves the Internet, we, we and actually our, in our recent move into games is that um, we have a daughter, we have a 10 year old, 
old daughter. And we just got so excited watching her like download apps and the way she would interact with them. And, and so um, in the same way that Owen did billboards and I used to do a lot of community-based artworks um, that would involve many participants, like we've always been very interested in um, getting people outside of galleries and museums to engage with the work. Um, so that's, that's part of the reason we've been doing more um, games. Um, but I was trained as a painter, so sometimes I just have like a, a desperate need to paint. So every once in a while I kind of circle back to that, um, or drawing is at the core of my practice. I've been doing a lot of that too. So um, normally, you know, the form is driven by the ideas. Is there anything to add to that? No? Great. Um, Nick Cook, you're up next. Nick. Hi. Um, my question was just, uh, when you were creating the monsters in Tally Saves the Internet, how did you come up with all the different types? Like, was it just like a big brainstorm you guys did? Or is there some type of list online that like, I don't know. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, am I taking this one too? Yeah. Yeah. So um, you made more than I did. Well, at the at the very beginning, um, Tally Tally really became Tally as a pink blob um, when I was doing the first Ida three country Fulbright to Germany, um, Chile, and Hong Kong. And um, in Germany, uh, we made Tally for the first time. And only um, three or four years later did I realize it was she. She became like it came into being at the same time as all the women's marches that were happening. So I think there's some connection there with the color and the shape of her. Um, but anyhow, then I made this plug monster. Um, it's, and, um, and at that point we knew we had um, researched uh, marketing, the interactive um, advertising bureaus, um, like marketing categories. They have all these different categories. Um, there's over 700 of them. Um, I think the, the spreadsheet is in the presentation. And so that just became the conceptual framework for the monsters. So we knew that there were all these different ways that um, people were, you know, people were being tagged and, and pages were being tagged and then people were being placed into categories. So we just wanted to, you know, create monsters around those. Um, so yeah, we just kind of kept ticking them off and we would have students work with us um, sometimes during the summer that's on the credits page, some of those students and, and they would chip away at them. But of course with 700 um, categories, there's still, I think we've done how many, 250 or something like that. Um, so yeah, if I have a little bit of free time, I might add a monster if I'm feeling inspired. Um, but yeah, they're just kind of fun to do. Our daughter has come up with some ideas too. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. The toilet bowl monster. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a quick follow-up question about it. Yeah. Amy, do they have names? Do they have names? Oh, that's good. Um, yeah, it's normally just the marketing cat like the the marketing category, like the kind of like the Internet of Things monster or uh -huh. um, what else? I don't know. Uh, it's always some kind of marketing category. Um, for a while, some in the early days, some of the students in my humanities startup class were giving them names, but they were, it's hard to, you know, with 100 and, or 200 monsters, it's hard to keep track of their names. Um, so we just, we just know their, their monster ID and their, and their um, advertising category. Great. So the next question, uh, Gina, I think I have that right. Gina? Oh, uh, Jenna? Sorry. I'm, I'm just a bit discombobulated here. I was just making sure you were talking about me. <laughs> um, so my question is basically about, you know, your, your work is pretty meta because you know, obviously you use the internet and data to also critique those very things. So, I mean, that's less of a question and more of a, I wonder what else you have to say about that. That we almost named our daughter Meta. <laughs> <laughs> and then we decided that would be a really bad idea. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> um, yeah, I, Owen, what do you want to say that it's? That I'm glad we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think, yeah. That. It would have been fine. Yeah, it, it no, I've, been... I've just always been interested in these types of systems, things that are bigger than us. So um, I, I appreciate that you, you think of it in those terms. Um, that's great. Yeah. Did you want to? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a great compliment. Thanks, Jenna. I think that, um, yeah, you know, we have a research-based practice, which is, you know, maybe not that unusual anymore, but, you know, in like when we were coming out of graduate school, it still pretty much was, but um, so, so it, so to, to us, it, it's a, it's a high compliment to say that you're, you know, to, to, to interpret your statement as such, as in, in a way that says, oh, you, you've, you've done your research, you, you've, you've read about, you know, what, what are the experts on this subject saying, you incorporate their ideas and, um, and, and add your own and, you know, and, and you kind of contribute in the same way that, uh, you know, uh, any other artistic work like a, a, a film or a, a poem or a book might. Um, so thank you. Okay, great. So next uh, question, Alexandra. Hi, um, um, in the video you provided prior to this, you mentioned the explode the web extension and um, you speak a little bit on digital architecture and the benefit of dismantling some of these spaces. Hmm. Um, I'm just curious, do you think that there are some spaces that should be exempt from being dismantled or has <laughs> digital architecture become something irremovable from marketing or other influences? Well, that's a great question. I mean, it's funny because we're, we're dealing with the whole like defund the police here, here in the United States. And um, a lot of people feel strongly about that, but then there's other people that are strong Democrats that are like, no, that's like too, too negative. And it's not, you know, like throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Um, I think, um, I don't know, whenever, when I, when I think of scram, I think part of it is I'm a control freak. So if I can like, like break things apart and like re-scramble them and try to piece them back together, I think that's a very, it's a very productive, hopeful space for me. It sounds like very, um, yeah, emo or like mm -hmm. angsty, but I actually find it like a really, really conceptually productive, formally productive space. Um, but I'm sure, yes, there's there's places. I mean, if we if we explode the architecture of the web too much, um, tally would not work, for example. So, I mean, it's with with within limits, I guess. I have a background. My my both of my grandfathers were uh, well. I shouldn't just say my grandfathers. My grandparents were farmers, and um, so they they were pretty poor. I think, relatively speaking, and they had to make use of whatever materials that they had, and so they didn't throw things away. If the, if a gate had been broken by uh, like a, a runaway bull or something, and then they would save the piece of the gate and then reuse that later on. I think that um, the way somehow maybe that's that, it, that kind of, I grew up thinking that taking things apart and putting them back together is not just normal, but it's how you learn. And um, like, I, I can remember my brother, my brother who teaches uh, diesel mechanics is, um, you know, he, he would like take typewriters apart and leave the pieces, the keys all over the, our bedroom, you know, and, um, and I, I uh, one of the assignments in my class is called view source in my intro to web class. And it's about, you know, thinking about the internet, not as a series of pictures and buttons, but, but as a, a, um, a, a bunch of images of buttons that are presented to you as a veneer, as a shiny veneer that uh, is um, trying to hide how messy the structure is of the internet and 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 how there are these structures like you know the you know the Facebook advertising system or the fact that um, every time you visit a web page on the internet there's a there's an auction that happens where all of your data is sent to all these uh, 
uh, little bots who, who bid on the possibility to buy the ad space to manipulate you uh, based on how well they think they can um, convert you to a, a paying customer. And so um, I think that, I think the explode the web is just a really apt metaphor that points to all of these things that, that we need to see the structure, that, that it's okay to take things apart, that, that the, the internet, that, that even computers that, that try to hide all of the messy workings underneath are, are kind of lying to us in some, to some degree. <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely in one camp when it comes to when I when the new Apple operating system comes out and they've they've hidden yet another play, button to get to your home menu. It just it drives me crazy. <laughs> okay, great. A couple more here. Uh, Shirley again. Uh, hello, this is a little bit unrelated, but um. Uh, since we were talking about visual representation of data, uh, I was thinking with the recent U.S. election, um, there's been many forms of visual representation of the election data. And the most used one being the U.S. map color with uh, red and blue. And it's becoming obvious that there's been a divide um, in sort of like an area and urban cities versus uh suburbs so do you feel that like there is a better way to represent these data have you like critiqued it in any sort of way oh yes <laughs> wait, wait, you heard about the u.s election <laughs> <laughs> what go ahead what's your critique uh so um there there are several ways to kind of approach that that question but the the one that comes to mind first is that um uh, uh, maps lie. In fact, there's a there's a great book called How Maps Lie. I highly I highly recommend it. Um, it points to a lot of the ways that the maps maps have to lie because there's so much detail that could be rendered on a map that um, at uh, higher and higher zoom levels you have to obscure or simplify and remove detail in order to make it actually usable. So you you lie in order to tell the truth. The US election is a very specific one because it's influenced by not just the gerrymandering that's been going on, but the, uh, the fact that um, the constitution is, uh, lacks some important insights and foresights uh, to, to how the US would evolve. It, it just assumed that there would be an equal number of people per land unit in the United States, and that's not the case. So when you look at the United States, uh, election map, and you, the first thing you you notice is that there are red states and there are blue states, but that's not really the case because, I mean, even in the most red states like Alabama, uh, it's something like forty seven percent of the people still voted Democrat, so it's not a red state. They're all purple. Some are just more blue or red than others, right? And all we we all have to live next to each other for better or worse. <laughs> and so that's the first thing. But then the other thing is this really great uh, thing that the, the New York Times data data people are, are really great. They, um, they did two things this time. They, they acknowledge that data is messy and that uh, polls and predictions are really messy. And so they have this, they have, uh, they show margin of error more than any other of the kind of like online maps of the of the election data, they show that that these are estimates, and they are you know you might say that you know Donald Trump's going to win by plus one, but you know there's a five a five point margin of error, so like it could go you know either way. Uh, and then the other thing they do is they show the they show um, instead of a coral plus map, so that's the map you speak of uh, when you take land mass and you uh, you divide it into sections and you give those sections colors. It's called a choropleth. Um, and they have a different type of map. And um, instead of representing the land masses as different colors, they, they take the um, number of people in each section and they represent those as bubbles. And so when you transform it from choropleth land mass representation to the actual number of people, then you see that it's, you see why Biden won the election, for example. Uh, and then they have another one that's just based on the electorates, um, the Electoral College. A lot of things in the chat, yeah. <laughs> but um, 
so yeah, so those are my thoughts about it. I, I have a I have a class called Data Culture, and I um, yeah we have a week on maps. We have another week on margin of error. Um, I I love those weeks. Those are I, I love to talk about how 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 maps lie. And I have a whole I have a whole presentation that's just it just has all these ways that charts lie. Um, and um, yeah, it's it's I think yeah it's a fascinating subject. But we, we can move on to another question. <laughs> um, time is flying as it always does because this is a great conversation. But maybe two more, if that's okay with. Okay, yeah. so that's great. Thanks. Fatima, you're next. Hi. So I'll just read what I wrote in the chat. It says, uh, "Would you consider Tally save the uh, saves the internet as a VPN or just purely a way to spread awareness on cybersecurity? Would you ever consider expanding Tally into a virtual private network?" Um, somebody asked us a similar kind of question um, recently. It wasn't a VPN. It was whether or not uh something but uh yeah i think that tally is an, an incredibly irresponsible project to make <laughs> it's it just i, I could go on in, in so many details about how hard that project was to make technically and um it's it's insane and uh so <laughs> um i but i don't think i mean you know VPNs are great, you know, um, they, for example, allow you to access information that you couldn't access uh, if you were in a um, place that was um, censoring data, for example, or um, so, but I don't think we have any plans to, to move forward in any particular direction with Tally. We, um, it was really, so, so we, when we decided to make games, we said we were gonna make three games and, uh, and each of those games was gonna be progressively, um, uh, uh, we were gonna learn something from those games. So the first one we made, we didn't talk about, it's called The Speed of Thinking. It's on the App Store, you can download it. Um, and so that was a way to think about, um, to start to think about publishing games. And then Tally was a way to, with our first like kind of big multiplayer game and uh, the next game we're going to do is going to be uh, based on story somehow. And um, those are the those are the three steps we were kind of preparing ourselves to, to start to launch like big games. And um, so it, in some ways, it's it's like an experiment. And um, so we'll, we'll see what happens with Tally. But uh, it's not going to be a, uh, it's not it's not going to like there's not going to be any feature creep. <laughs> I, I mean, I really love those projects still. And um, there's been many times where I've wanted to like crowdsource the product monsters. I always thought that would be really amazing to see what people brought to it and all their like sort of emotional baggage. And there's already a lot of different styles in the monsters. So I thought that could be interesting, but Owen's right. I mean, he basically built the, a, a sort of game engine from scratch. I mean, it. It was just so much work. This project was so much work. And L the LA County Museum of Art, um, we, we were finalists for their art and technology program. And um, I think that that could be interesting to, you know, like if you had more support, but for us to soldier on by ourselves and expand it um, by ourselves, I don't, I don't see that happening. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it's a good question though. Those are good ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a super, it was a super learning experience. And, and I mean, I speak of it like it's over, but it's, I mean, it's not, you know, we still haven't, I feel like we still haven't officially launched it. <laughs> <laughs> We're still debugging. Yeah, yeah, but it's, um, but you should go and play it because it, I mean, it, in, for all practical purposes, it works now. Uh, there are just a couple features that I still wanna add. And I haven't told Joelle about them yet because she'll get mad at me because it'll be more work. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Marilyn, maybe you wanna end with your question? Yeah, I have um, a lot of questions, but one of them I keep thinking about as you this afternoon is about your audience um, and how you think about your audience. Like it seems like the works you make are for everyone, um, which I think is really wonderful. But I'm also thinking about how you swap between different media because you make 
works to exist online and then also in public spaces and how you think about your audience when you're making works and how media maybe plays into that. Yeah, I think I think our audience has been shifting over the years. I mean, when I made the Sherwin series, um, I was still very focused on gallery and museum output. Um, and then as it switched to making apps and games and browser extensions, it expanded that audience. And that was really important as a sort of like manifesto mission type of strategy. Um, but but yeah, I don't know. I, th I think that's a good direction to go, but there's times like I was looking at your work and I think it's amazing and it looks so cohesive and it looks so great in the museum and gallery setting. And there's part of me that would like would like to like um, be able to present my work in such a like cohesive way. But then there's another part of me is that, you know, it's the Walt Whitman quote, I am, I am large, I contain multitudes, you know, like I just, that's just kind of how it's happened. Mm -hmm. Um, audience wise, I mean, it's people that it's not just everybody on the internet, but people that have these concerns, I guess, um, about data privacy, um, that want to know the things that are under the hood. So I, I think your point about, um, I don't know if you raised it in the video or not that we sent them, but the, that your point about the reason why we went into games is because of audience is really a good point um you know because in in some ways it so if you if you're engaged in the art world and you're 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 studying art and you're, you're going out and and you're everything you're thinking about is you know what's the meaning of this what how what is my audience going to think who, who is supposed to see this and what are they what do i hope they think um well you you your you know there are certain gatekeepers in the art world and you know, like you're in Alberta, we're in North Carolina. We're not. Neither of us are in New York. You know, neither of us are have our best friends with the director of MoMA. You know, and so we have to ask ourselves, you know, like how do I get that audience? How do I actually reach that? I think that's an important question. Like, how do you actually? How are you going to find that audience? And and so, I think our 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 move to uh, digital means it kind of acknowledges the, the, the fact that, you know, art is decentralized, that, that you don't have to play the gamekeeper game, gatekeeper game, you can, you can go out and find um, whatever audiences you want. And, you know, if, if, it's, if it's an app, that's great because it's, it's free. There's no, you know, anybody can download it and anybody can see it. If it's on the internet, anybody can see it. Um, and so, yeah. But I think it's also like I, I had been listening to, I think it's called the Creative Pep Talk podcast or something like that. This guy, Andrew, Andy J Pizza is his name. Anyhow, he talks a lot about like thinking about audience, not in terms of a dirty wor word, but really thinking about connecting to like minded people and getting back to Owen's points about value added. Like what what are you as an artist bringing to that community? Like what what? what will inspire them to think about things in new ways. So, I mean, I hope that our work does that as well. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I, I just wanted to say one last thing. I think that um, <laughs> like, it doesn't always have to be about audience. You can sometimes, you can make a work for yourself. You can make a work for a very small for audience, you know, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have to always have mass appeal, but um, that's, um, but it, but it certainly feels like a, a way to kind of combine maybe an activist or uh, social conscience and in, intention with mm -hmm. with ar an artistic practice to to think about you know creative practice and activism and the same kind of thing and um, as a way to just you know be a citizen and be engaged and uh, yeah but I just want to acknowledge it, it doesn't always have to be for this massive thing. You know, like, <laughs> It's like, it could be just for one person. I, I have made many arts just for Joelle. <laughs> I like That's the note arts. we're gonna end on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> in a sense, was Tally in a way maybe made for your daughter? 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Where's that? You have your book? Yeah, that's how we judge our work anymore. Does Sophia I think it's very exciting? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Because <laughs> she won't lie. She will tell us if she doesn't like it. <laughs> well, I'm here. I'm gone. I'm here. I'm gone. <laughs> I was looking for your book because I there's that merit badge I made for her the other day, but I don't know. So uh, we're at three o'clock. That was really a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much for your generosity and for the presentation and the dialogue. Uh, it was just terrific. And uh, maybe we could do a quick clap, everyone. <laughs> uh, it was really great. Marilyn, I don't know if you want to end with anything. Yeah, really, really huge thanks. And once again, it's such an honor to have you here. And thank you for your presentation. Hopefully, this is the beginning of something more. Um, I think there's a lot of interest in your work and hopefully we can start some relationship. Yeah, that's that's great. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for this format too. It just was so fun to do the presentation before and just be relaxed with the Q and A. It's much more active and exciting to us as well. So thanks for having us again. I totally agree. Thank you. It's really great to meet you all. Great. Sorry, just to my group, if you could stay online, that'd be great. And to everyone else. Yeah. To my group, if we can hop over to the other Zoom room. <laughs> uh, thanks again, Joel and Owen, I'll, I'll be in touch. Um, Ashley. Oh, uh, let's do that another time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye, thank you. Bye, Sean, I'll see you later. Yeah, talk to you soon. All right.